Everyone, please stand up, and uh, we'll come to the Lord in prayer before the English service starts. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for this day that you've given us, and thank you for um, the relationship that you've given us through uh, your Son, Jesus Christ, God. Uh, thank you for coming and dying on the cross for us so that we may be forgiven, so that we can come to you, so that we can have your presence um, in us and in our lives, uh, in our hearts, God. God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your will is done upon all of us this hour as we dedicate this time and this part of our lives um, to spending with you, to focusing on you, God. And may our praise and worship be pleasing unto you, God. Um, Holy Spirit, please uh, dwell in us. Uh, now and in all the days that you've given us to live, to teach us and lead us and guide us to live uh, in a pleasing way uh, to you, God. And if we do fail um, to make the right choices, God, please convict our hearts and lead us to repentance so that we can be forgiven and be reconciled to you, God. God, I pray that um, your will is done on heaven and earth and on every congregation everywhere that gathers in the name of Jesus, God. Um, may all of uh, the things that we say and do be pleasing unto you now. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
before we sing this next song, I just want everyone to think back to a time where God has just blessed you and just provided for you. Uh, maybe it's just the, the close and great friends you may have, the loving parents, uh, the tablet you have to just play games with your friends. It's all the little things that God has provided for you. I just want everyone to remember that that same God that has provided you in those times is there for you in your lows. And that when times get hard, just not turn ever away from God. But in those times, grow closer to God. Uh, and never forget to prioritize God. Because that same God is there for you in your highs, but even more in your lows. So as we walk on in this life, to just never forget that. And never forget that God will always love you. Let's get ready for the next song.
this time, would Tracy please pray for us? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here today to fellowship with you and to fellowship with each other. I pray that your will be done upon each and every one of us. And may you help us apply your word into our lives. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Can I please have Sophie and Amtung take offering for us? Please stand and bow their heads as I will lead us in prayer. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all here today to be able to praise and worship your name, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful life that you have blessed with us, with us for us, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we all grow, that we are able to grow in the faith and grow in the word, Lord. I pray that we are able to build up the courage to spread your love to others, Lord. Lord, I pray that you keep us all healthy, and I pray that you keep us all safe amidst this pandemic, Lord. Lord, I pray that um, if we are stressed or if we are in any dark spots, Lord, I pray that you help us through it, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless everyone here today, Lord. I pray that you remind us who we are, Lord. I pray that we see the path that you have paid out for us, Lord. I pray that we stay on that path, Lord. I pray that if we stray from you, Lord, I pray that you help us get back to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you remind us every day that we are loved by you and everyone else around us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Today we're reading Psalms 19, verses 1 through 11. I will read a verse and you will read a verse and we will alternate as we read aloud. For the director of music, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. They have no speech. They, are used, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The, sat the statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Please be seated as I invite Pastor Chris Lee up to the stage to share her message. So this morning we are going to answer, is faith, opposed, is faith in God opposed to science? And um, I was riding home at the fried chicken place last night, and I asked a survey a question out of like uh, a sample size of four people. And one of them did not respond because they didn't even hear the question because their ear pod was on. But I think you guys have um, a pretty good idea of what the struggle is or what the problem is um, between faith in God and science. Um, and it's very clear if you've ever, you know, opened a science book in science class, probably starting from the third or fourth grade, um, when you read about, you know, the theory of evolution, 
the Big Bang Theory, um, things like that. And then you come into church and you hear, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and he did it in six days. That's how Genesis describes it. You know my thoughts about the days. Um, but you see a very clear conflict um, between uh, what you hear at school and uh, what you hear at church. And the conflict is made even worse because at school, that's the place where you go to get knowledge. That's where facts are taught. Um, that's where, you know, they, um, and it's a, it's a false notion, but that's where you learn to be smart. But, uh, you know, uh, book smart, I don't really equate to um, true intelligence, but at least that's where you gain a lot of knowledge. So how do you connect what you read in the Bible and your faith in God and to the science that you learn? And um, is faith in God really opposed to science? So in the, the book of Psalms, chapter 19, this is what we're going to use to answer um, the question this morning. You know, creation versus evolution, um, that's a very clear indicator that faith and science may not go together. But then um, also, uh, just the scientific method. Who's heard of the scientific method? All right, so one of the part of the scientific method is first you observe something, then you make a hypothesis, which is a, you know, a, a guess as to what's going on, and then you experiment with it, and then you draw the conclusion, yes, uh, my hypothesis is right, no, it wasn't right, then you, you know, make another hypothesis and, and uh, go forward. The problem with that, when you think in terms of God, is God cannot be observed. So right off the bat, there's no observation. You cannot see God. So that's why um, uh, some people think that God or faith in God is, um, you know, not in the realm of science. Um, as some people who are more humble, they say God cannot be known because we can't see God. And then some more people who, uh, or people who are bolder uh, outright says there is no God because you can't see him. It's in everybody's imagination. The Bible's full of fairy tales. Um, so, and then the third thing which I mentioned, faith or facts mentality. Um, you know, again, facts are things that we observe to be true or have proven to be true, like the sun rising in the east, um, scientific stuff like the water cycle um, and why rain occurs, um, and mathematics, uh, you know, uh, two plus two equals four, and that is a truth because that's what we're taught. Um, we as a society often hear the word faith connected with events that are uh, scientifically abnormal, um, that, are, that cannot be understood uh, you know, rationally with the mind, um, or cannot be worked out like a math equation. So we develop this thinking that uh, facts are facts, and faith refers to things that are not facts, i.e. not true. So, uh, all those things, uh, you know, come into play with our faith. And I feel it's necessary for us to actually um, take a good look about faith in God and science, and the science that we know to be true. Um, there are things that are called hypotheses or theories, um, but there are certain things that are true um, that we recognize that have been proven in science. Um, so first, I want to, before we even get anywhere uh, um, with answering the question, I want to bust some myth. Who watches Mythbusters? Okay, good. So it's kind of like that. All right. First, I want to kind of just dispel or do away with the notion um, that you cannot be a person of science and believe in God or have faith in God because historically, Many of the greatest scientists in the history of modern um, mathematics, physics, mechanical science, um, and innovations um, believed in God. And I've just named a few. Um, Copernicus, uh, both Copernicus, um, Kepler, as well as Galileo, all thought that the uh, Earth revolved around the sun, opposed to um, you know, the sun revolving around the earth, which people thought at that time. And so uh, all of these people believed in the existence of God. And Descartes, uh, the famous philosopher that came up with the phrase, I think, therefore I am, 
John Harvard, uh, which the University of Harvard is named after him. He, he was actually a minister. He was a pastor. Isaac Newton, uh, who uh, created the theory of gravitation um, or discovered gravity. Uh, Michael Faraday produced electricity. Um, Gregor Mendel, he was a father of genetics. And a lot of people uh, thought that if his research was published um, just a little bit earlier, um, we would never have Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, so he worked a lot with breeding uh, certain plants. Um, Lord Kelvin, where we get the Kelvin um, temperature scale. Max Planck, the inventor of quantum theory. Now, all of these people have one thing in common, and they are a believer of God. They have faith in God. So right off the bat, we know that you can be a person of tremendous uh, learning, of tremendous, um, you know, a, a thinker, and believe in God. And then, um, the second thing that I want to bring to your attention is you may think that, oh, those are like so dead people, they're so long ago. So I want something current for you. This is actually a survey of over 2,000 professors, college professors, um, from universities that are science-based, research-based um, uh, universities. And so, uh, two people, uh, Elaine Eklund and Christopher Sh uh, Shetley, asked uh, over 2,100 faculty members from these universities. 75% of them responded. And uh, these are their response. These are the percent of professors that do not believe in God. And this was taken very recently in 2007, uh, within the past 20 years. So you see here that the highest percent to professors within these, the first three are, are um, more, um, uh, you know, the, the, the last three, sociology, economics, political science, and psychology are referred to as the soft sciences. But physics, chemistry, and biology um, are hardcore sciences. And so you can see the highest percent is 41% of these professors do not believe that there is a God. But what does that really mean if you flip it over? That means that more than 50% or up to 60% or 70% in some of these, um, you know, sciences believe that there is a God. And in fact, the researchers concluded that the belief in God or non-belief in God has nothing to do with their study of science. Most of their belief or disbelief were uh, tied to cultural family ties. If they, you know, had familial influence that took them to church as they, when they were younger, a lot of the professors who were foreign or came from, uh, you know, outside of the United States um, were not, uh, uh, did not believe in a God. Um, and so science has nothing to do with uh, belief in God or not. And in fact, we find that over 50% of people currently um, in science believe that there is a God. And of course, we cannot talk about science without Albert Einstein. He's probably considered um, the most influential uh, scientist in recent history within the past 100 years. And this is what he said. He said, in view of such harmony in the cosmos, um, the cosmos is all of the earth, the heavens and earth, which I, with my limited human mind, am able to recognize. Yet there are people who say there is no God. He's really saying that even I, with my limited human mind, can recognize that there is a God. Yet I don't understand why some people say there is no God. But what really makes him angry, but what really makes me angry is that they quote me for the support of such views. He made it very clear that although he did not believe in a personal God like we do, he believed that there is a God. And so, uh, and also when uh, he was asked about, um, he was asked, do you accept the historical existence of Jesus? He said, unquestionably. He said, no one can read uh, the gospel without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His person, uh, personality pulsates in every word. No myth can be filled with such life. So that is the exact word of one of the greatest scientists of our time, Albert Einstein. And so I wanted to just right off the bat dispel any thoughts that you may have or you've been told that you cannot be a, a person of academia, a person of science and research and have faith in God because they are actually not opposed. And this is when we get to the answer. Um, does faith in God, is faith in God opposed um, to science? 
And um, let me change my view so I can see. Um, hold on. So in first, um, to get into the answer, I divided faith and facts. And this is not just a, uh, a regular background. This is actually the visualization of um, a magnetic field of the universe. So this is a visualization of data that has been taken from the European Space Agency um, from the Planck satellite. And the image portrays the interaction between the interstellar dust in the Milky Way and um, the structure of our galaxy's magnetic field. So whenever you put the magnetic dust and you put a magnet by it and you see all the dust kind of form the pattern, this is a visualization of the magnetic field of the Mil Milky Way and the particles uh, within it. And so I just thought that was a very interesting picture. And to answer our first question about faith versus facts. Now, a lot of people think that faith in God does not require facts. Um, because uh, a fact basically means something that is known or proven to be true. And as a Christian, you don't have to give up your faith uh, for facts or give up any facts for your faith. Um, they, uh, they are actually uh, required. You are required to have facts to have faith in God, and you are required to have faith to see the facts about God. And so uh, true faith should never be blind. Uh, blind faith meaning that you don't know why you believe in the things you believe, you just believe. Okay, I hope that none of you will grow up uh, in this church, attending church, um, in the Bible studies, having blind faith. Everybody needs to have evidence. In fact, like I mentioned earlier this year, faith is the evidence of things hoped for is the substance of uh, things that are unseen. So they, we have to have evidence. Um, and that's why I encourage all of you to read the Bible, attend Bible studies, ask questions, um, and know exactly why you believe uh, in God, in Jesus Christ. And that's why this entire year we've dedicated and focused on the evidence that points to the factual existence of a person named Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection from the tomb, and uh, all the historical um, artifacts that have been found to support what is written in our Bible. And so there are facts that go along with our faith. Um, and sometimes maybe you think that there's so many facts I can't remember it all. Remember at the beginning of the year when we talked about um, you know, the, uh, the theories and the laws of thermodynamics, and you may be thinking, oh, I don't remember all those facts. Well, you don't have to, because in the Bible, um, we have in, in the book of John, a man that was born blind, and Jesus healed him, and he could see again. And people were asking him, the authorities were asking him, his parents were asking him, who is this man, Jesus? You know, what did he do to you? Is he a sinner? Is he a bad person? Is he a good person? He said, I don't know. I don't know anything. I just know that I was blind and now I see. That's just one fact that he knew. But it was a very compelling fact, a very strong fact that he experienced for himself. And that's why he believed. So regardless if you have a lot of facts or just that one compelling fact that you know to be true, that's proven, that Jesus Christ is God, you need to have evidence of your faith, evidence of why you believe in what you believe. If not, it's going to be blind faith. And so faith and facts actually go hand in hand, and they are not opposed to each other. So uh, our, faith is, uh, our faith in God is based on facts, um, based on things that could be known, based on evidence. Um, and you know, a lot of the Bible is written by witnesses, and people, uh, discount it, discount meaning treat it not as serious, um, treat it not as reliable. Um, but you know what? In the current court of law, if you have a witness, at least two witnesses that saw someone commit a crime, that's enough to put someone uh, in jail. So in the Bible, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all of the New Testament, there were hundreds of witnesses who saw Jesus Christ after his resurrection and touched him and felt where the nails were. And so, you know, 
uh, I think we have to see that there's a special kind of discrimination against the facts that we rely our faith on, um, discounting them because it's a witness account. But when you compare it with sec the secular world and what goes on now, eyewitness accounts are taken with full credibility, enough to put someone away, enough to convict them and put them to death on death row. And so you have to also see that there's an unfair discrimination against the facts that we rely our, our faith on. Um, and then second, uh, part of this answer um, is, is a faith in God opposed to science? Um, no, uh, it's because we should not be misled into thinking that is faith, that our faith is absent of facts or rational thinking. In fact, um, to me, I think that God is actually the original, uh, original author of the scientific method. Remember what I said, observation, hypothesis, test, and then conclusion? Uh, and this is why I say God is the original author of the scientific method. Uh, who can tell me historically who is the um, creator of the scientific method? There is actually a couple of different people, Bacon being one of them, Aristotle um, being another. So there are various people who through the years have developed this, you know, okay, what do we need to find out to see if this is true or not? So they all come up with a very similar process, observation, see what's going on, um, hypothesis, uh, take a guess at why it, occur it occurs, why it happens, test it, and then draw your conclusion. Is that true or is that not true? Well, God, I say, is the original creator of the scientific method because although he is invisible, he has given us a lot of things to observe. And this is why I chose the book of Psalms, chapter 19, because in Psalms, who declares God's glory? Who is speaking his wisdom? Invisible things? No, very visible things. Um, in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 19 that we've just read, I'll read to you the first couple of verses. And all of it applies to science, if we think about it. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And so we see here, God knows that he gave us eyes. God knows that we want to look at things evaluate things, find out what it's like, discover what it does. And so he gave us physical things. In our life, we have five senses or six senses, some people would say, but all of that, God has created a world for us to use all five senses to learn, to discover, to get new information, to take that information, process it, think about it, and create new things that's called innovation. And so right here it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Um, and they don't really speak, but what does the Bible say? They have no speech, they use no words, um, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. That's why Paul says in the New Testament that ever since the creation of the universe, everyone can see God's nature, God's invisible qualities when they see everything that God has created. And so everything around us, the plants, the animals, the heavens, the earth, the universe, the galaxy, God created us to observe, to see, and to see God within it. Okay, so observation. Uh, Psalms 19, the entire universe. And this is an actual image from the Hubble telescope that was launched in 1990. Um, and over the course of those years, since 1990 to now, the Hubble telescope has received a couple of upgrades um, to get clearer images. But it says here in that small font, font, the telescope has sent back more than a million observations and amazing images. And so God has created all of that to learn about himself. And so, observation, hypothesis. Um, do you find it very strange that all cultures believe in a God or some kind of God? And it's very, uh, it's not a coincidental 
um, that all cultures believe that God created the world that we live in. A lot of cultures believe that many gods create the world that we live in. A lot of cultures uh, attribute to one god, um, like Mother Earth. Um, but all, all cultures believe that everything we have come from a higher being, a creator of some sort. Okay, and so in the book of uh, Acts, this is what Paul says in Acts 17, chapter 27. Let me read this to you. Um, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offering. He's speaking to people who don't believe in, in Jesus Christ, people who are not um, Christians. And yet, in their poems, in their um, learnings, in their uh, academic writings, they said, we are the offspring of God. Isn't that exactly what the Bible has said? That God created us and we are his children? And so it's no coincidence that when everybody in this world observes what God has created, they acknowledge that there is a God that created all of this. And that's our hypothesis of God. And it can only be a hypothesis because until Jesus Christ came, nobody really knew God and could understand um, God until Jesus revealed God to us. And so test. And so we have observation, hypothesis, and test. And right over in um, chapter 17, 11, this is what um, people did when they heard the gospel of Jesus, when they heard about Jesus. In chapter 17, 11, um, Paul came to a place called Berea. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness. And what did they do? And then they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true, to see if what Paul said was true. So how do you test something? You, you take what you think, you compare it to what you know or have proven to be true. And for their, their case, it was the scripture. They took the scripture, the Old Testament, to be absolute truth. So they compared this new teaching about Jesus Christ with the scripture. And then what happened? As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. And when you compare um, this unknown hypothesis to something that is proven to be true, you can come to a very solid conclusion. And so, um, some people will say that, well, that's circular reasoning. If you compare what you hear with the Bible, then what if the Bible's fake and it's all fake? Well, let's take us out of that circle. And what can we test? Um, we can test known facts from science. And so for as, a, um, as an example, um, the uh, Big Bang Theory, who's heard of the Big Bang Theory? The Big Bang Theory is uh, so important to Christian faith because of this reason. Before the Big Bang Theory, people of science thought that the universe was eternal, meaning it had no start and it will not have an end. So everything the Bible says is false, right? Because, you know, revelations, which we're going to read about, is about the end. But with the Big Bang Theory, it gave uh, a very solid correspondence to the Bible. The Big Bang Theory theorized that the Earth, all of the universe, had a beginning, a starting point, and it will have an end. And it correlates exactly with the very first words of Genesis. In the beginning, God created. So, what we can know is that what is already proven in life, in science, and we correlate that with what the Bible tells us. And 100% of the time, I will tell you that it will correlate because God created it all. And so the rest of chapter 19, um, it tells us about God's laws, God's decree. They are trustworthy. They make the, the simple wise. Um, in, in this life, God has created certain things that we can know, we can discover, and we can hold to be true. And so... On the flip side of that, I want to tell you that in terms of tests and proving things, 
atheists, people who don't believe in God, people who claim there is no God, has never been able to prove beyond a doubt that there is no God. So, you know, the onus should be on the people who make certain claims to prove what they say is true. And if you say there is no God, you should be able to prove scientifically, without a doubt, that there is absolutely no God. But until today, and until forever, um, there, will be, there will be no such proof, there will be no such evidence. Um, atheists have never been able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no God. And yet all the discoveries that we keep coming across, uh, the laws of gravity, uh, the Big Bang Theory, correspond to what we can know about God, about our Earth, about our universe that is written in the Bible. And so, uh, test and then conclusion. The God that created the universe, like I said, everybody who has tested, take what they've known from science and applied it to uh, what the Bible writes, they can come to the conclusion and come to the conclusion confidently, surely, that God is the creator. The God of the Bible is the creator. And before all the enlightenment, before all the uh, industrial revolution, this is what um, Paul says in the book of Hebrews. Let me read to you Hebrews chapter 11. And Paul says this very confidently. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, um, right under that very important verse that I quoted, uh, from 11 chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So, this is Paul's conclusion. This is any person who actually take a, a really good look um, and tested it can conclude. Uh, Paul says that we can understand not just you know, um, hypothesize, but he says, understand with our minds. We can understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible, meaning that it came from an invisible God, what we now see. And so, observation, uh, hypothesis, test, conclusion, all of that God has given us to discover about himself. And so there's no reason why we sh should think that we can't think rationally about God, about the things that we read in the Bible, about all the little intricacies that we see, like um, that the Bible say. Like, what do I mean by intricacies? I mean little details. Let's go back to um, Psalms. I don't know if you caught it, but this is scientifically very accurate. In the book of Psalms, chapter 19, uh, let me uh, get there again. What did, uh, what did David say about the sun's warmth? I can't, uh, Psalms, okay. What did David say about the sun's warmth that is scientifically true? It says here, it rises, uh, it rises at, at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth, meaning that everything in, uh, in life, uh, everything on the earth, receives the warmth from the sun. That's why even when you um, wear t-shirts, when you go swimming, you still get a sunburn. Just a little detail. But uh, in a more scientific sense, everything gets life from the sun's warmth. That's why in those apocalyptic movies um, where you know um, total destruction happens and nothing grows on Earth, it's because either the sun was destroyed or um, you know there's a big cloud covering uh, the sun. But these kind of little intricate details we can get when we read God's word. And if you really read, the Bible has already described that the Earth was round. A lot of people blame Christians for thinking that the Earth was flat. But the Bible tells us that the earth is round. And so little intricate details that God has already placed there in his knowledge, in his words, in his wisdom, in all the things that he has created to know about himself, to discover about the world. Now, the third thing and the final thing I want you guys to understand why faith in God is not opposed to science is because, and very importantly, science has flourished because of faith in God. And this is why... 
uh, and this is what I want to uh, explain to you. It's actually the belief that there is a God, uh, the God of the Bible, um, that allowed the early philosophers, thinkers, scientists to flourish in their research and to, uh, to gain understanding. How? Because by believing in a God, um, by believing in a God of the Bible, um, and all these things it says here, it writes, um, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing of the soul. The statutes, which is another word for law, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. Imagine uh, if you believed there was no God. How would that affect your thinking? Imagine there was no God, and what the atheists say are true. There is no God. We are random chance of, you know, of this random process that, you know, um, Mentai used to be an amoeba millions of years ago. He's a single cell bacteria, and then he randomly developed into this person, and he randomly is going to develop into something else, I don't know, a million years from now, maybe a, a more higher version of himself. But there's no reason. It's just all chance, all probability. Um, there's no reason. Then why would you even go to school and learn anything? Because nothing has a purpose, right? And you can just play video games all day and be okay with that. Because life has no purpose. You're just a random act of chance upon this world, and this world itself is a random act of chance. If you did not believe in God, why would you even bother to discover anything? Because there's no meaning behind it. There's no reason, no purpose behind it. Or, let's say if you didn't believe in the God of the Bible and the certain laws that he has created, uh, and the laws are unchanging, just like God is unchanging, but you believed in a lot of gods and they acted on whatever you know, feelings they have for that day, how can you ever do any kind of research? Because what if today gravity, you know, pulls down, but tomorrow gravity pulls sideways and everything you dropped just went right. And then the next day on the random act of certain gods who controlled gravity, gravity actually moves upward. You guys imagine trying to play volleyball. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. No, I don't because it went that way. Because today gravity is like that because the God of gravity decided that it should be that way. How can you have you know, any consistency to systematically study anything and discover anything if you did not believe in a God that is never changing and always the same and his laws and his decrees are, are trustworthy and they are perfect. Um, and so it's actually the early philosophers, the early scientists actually believed that there is a God and it was because of that belief in a God who has created the universe, who has set certain laws that are unchanging within this universe. It allowed them to research and discover and to learn and to write their learnings down. And from those learnings, they're able to harness the power, harness the, the laws um, of nature into creating new innovations like electricity, like um, energy that we all have today. And so, I want to conclude with this. Again, this is Albert Einstein, and he said this uh, quote that I want to, all of us should have this kind of perspective when we look at the creation of God. He said, I'm not an atheist, so he says outright that I do not not believe in God, I do believe in God. I'm not an atheist, and I don't think I can call myself a pantheist. A pantheist means you believe in many gods, all gods. Um, we are in the position as a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books. It does not know how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. And that's, he's describing his process of discovering new things, trying to understand it. So he comes to the conclusion that it seems to me is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being towards God. So that is how he views himself towards God the creator, is a child, you know, trying to discover God, what God has written for him to, to learn, what God has given for him to discover. And so in conclusion, 
Science, which is the act of learning, the process of discovering new things about the world that we live in, either in nature, mechanical science, physical sciences, medical sciences about our bodies and how it functions, what causes diseases, all of that was given to us by God. And we can only discover, we can only research, we can only learn because of the laws God has set for each of those aspects of our lives, each of those uh, laws in physics and nature um, that we're able to uh, discover and learn. Everyone, please stand up. And this morning, uh, I want to uh, ask you, if you have not made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ, like I said, you know, it doesn't require all the facts and all the scientific proof and evidence in the world or in the Bible. It just requires one fact of what God has done in your life. And to be honest with you, I've known a lot of facts. I was taught a lot of facts growing up in the church. But what, without a doubt, revealed to me that God is real is when He touched my heart and I could feel His love for me. That is my fact. That is my evidence that there is a God and He loves me. So when you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you in your heart, Paul says that today is the day. Do not wait. Do not, uh, you know, harden your heart against the calling of God, but respond to Him. That is His evidence that He has placed in your heart for His existence to know that He loves you and He is there. So if you feel that today, if you hear God calling, then please, uh, you know, make that decision. Do not ignore God. And if you haven't believed in God, please come forward and I will help you pray. Um, and for the rest of you, be confident. Be confident that we have an awesome God. We worship the one and only true God and all the beautiful and magnificent things that we have in life came from Him. And you know what's even more awesome? He made all of that for us. To, to enjoy, for us to live, for us to um, understand His beauty and who He is. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, God, we thank You so much for all the evidences that You have given us, God, through nature, through the world that we live in, of who you are, your beauty and your magnificence and your awesomeness, God. God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your will is done on all these young individuals, God, that you've given such brilliant minds and, and hearts, God. God, you bless them during this time of the pandemic so that they um, are encouraged to learn, to keep up their education, God. And God, for those of us who are not academics, God, help us learn in other ways with our emotional intelligence, God, and all the senses that you've given us to experience all the things that you've created for us, God. God, I thank you for everything, every single thing that you've created in this life for us, God, and I thank you for loving us, God. God, um, please keep watch over all of us um, during this week and during this time, God, and may you bless all of us um, with this heart to always love you and to um, uh, crave and hunger for your truth and your knowledge, God. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul. of God, the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with all of us until we see you again. Amen.